Okay, welcome everybody. Hope you had a good week-long break. I missed everyone. Um, work one is due today on Blackboard. Homework two should be posted right now. It's due in two weeks. Um, and project three will be up sometime after class. So I'll send an email out to the class mailing list when project three is released. Uh, you'll have a lot of time on that. Uh, questions on class stuff before we get started? Yeah. When you do the first uh, iteration or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you stop after the last average, like when average never changes, or when all of them When all of them don't change. So you keep iterating over first sets until the f no first set changes. <coughs> That's how you know you're done. And we're going to go over, so I know there's been questions. Um, people have come to my office hours, the TA's office hours. So we're going to go, the plan for today is we're going to go over follow sets. We're going to go through an example for that. And then we're going to do whole end-to-end -end example using a grammar with uh, first sets, follow sets, and proving that there is a recursive descent parser for this grammar, and then actually writing that recursive descent parser. Um, so hopefully after this class, all the first set problem questions should go away. Any other questions before we get started? All right, so to refresh everyone's memory, including mine, uh, what we're, we've talked, we just went over first sets. You have hopefully been looking at first sets in your first homework assignment. Um, and the purpose of the first set, right, is the first set is the set of all tokens that that non-terminal can produce, what, they, what those strings start with. Um, whereas a follow set is kind of, well, it's a little bit different. So what we want from the follow set, we want to know for a given non-terminal here in this case A, what are the set of terminals that can appear after this non-terminal? So we're thinking like what comes after, in this case, capital A, as far as the resulting string. Um, and so here we have the, the type, if you will, that's returned by follow A is the set is not is terminals. And here we're going to represent the end of file by the dollar sign character, right? So if you think about what follows S, the starting symbol, well, S produces the entire string, right? So what follows S is going to be the end of file or the end of the string. Uh, so here that would be represented by the dollar sign. Questions about general follow? What, it's, what it is, at least the definition? Okay. So we're going to go back to the example, the kind of simple example that we've used before. And so we're going to use this. We're going to look at this. We're going to talk about it, think about why some of these follow sets are what they are, what they mean, how that makes sense kind of intuitively. Then we're going to go over the rules. And then we're going to go over how to apply those rules and kind of the mechanical algorithm to compute follow sets. Um, OK, so here we have our grammar. We have S goes to. Uh, big A, big B, big C, A goes to little A, B goes to big A, little B, or B, C goes to big C, little C, or epsilon. Uh, so what's in the follow set of S? What can follow S? Anybody brave enough to raise their hand? Yeah. End of file. End of file, yeah. So I kind of already said it, so you could be braver if you're using my words, right? Um, so yeah, anything else? And can anything else follow S? So how would you answer that question, I guess, would be a better, yeah. What was it, empty string? Um, so there's no epsilon here in the follow set because we're specifically talking about tokens. It's either going to be a token or it's going to be the end of the string. So in that case, you Kind of think of epsilon as the, the end of file in this case, meaning there's no more tokens after we parse S. Um, so the way really to look about this is think, OK, where in first sets we were, we were um, concerned about what's on the left-hand side of the production rules, here what we care about is where does this non-terminal appear on the right-hand side of the rules, right? Because that defines what appears after it. Um, so the first set of S, S doesn't appear in any of these, the right-hand sides of any of these rules. So the follow set of S is just going to be the end of file, right? So we know that if we parse S, 
There should be nothing after it because S generates the entire string. Does that make sense? And so another way we can use this is if we're writing a parser and we parse S and then our parser returns and then we say, okay, well, the next token better be an end of file, otherwise we didn't parse it. Like there's a, some kind of syntax error. Something's gone horribly wrong. So what about A? What follows A? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. A and end of file. A and end of file. How does A, so you're talking little a, right? Right, little a. So <laughs> why does little a follow big A? So you gotta think about follow, right? Yeah. In the, like, so afterwards. Just, just end of file. Exactly, so just, so why end of file? Because there's no letters inside the next thing. Yeah, that's a good way. To think about it right now. So, yeah, so this first rule, right? So we look for big A's on the right hand side, and then we say, okay, well, S goes to big A, so that means whatever follows S must follow A, right? So then we can add the dollar sign to A, and we don't see A anywhere else on any of the right hand sides, so we don't do anything there. So we say, okay, well, whatever has, whatever's after A has to be the end of the string. And this makes sense, right? Because if we generate A, we only, the only string we're gonna generate is a little a. So there's nothing after that string. There's nothing, no characters after that. We've reached the end of the input string. Uh, what about b? Small b, small b. wanna, yeah. Why small b? Can you speak up? I can't hear you. All I can hear is my booming microphone voice. So you gotta be loud. Right, so the first production is big b goes to big b, little b. Right, so we really don't care about the left-hand side here, we care about the right-hand side. We care about big B, little b. And so we say, what's gonna follow a big B? Well, in this case, clearly, it's gotta be a little b after a big B, right? So we add B in there. So what was the other one you said? Did you say something else? What was it? End of file, why end of file? The second production of the first rule, right? So S goes to A or B or C. The rule S goes to big B, well, by the same reason that we put the end of file into the follow set of A, the end of file goes into the follow set of B. Good. All right, what about C? So we wanna, yeah, in the back. Question. Yes. Is there any way a string can be generated that a little a follows a capital, the production of a capital A. So think about parsing, right? So we generate a string in this language. If we generate an A, what are the possible, so we're gonna generate an A, that generates some string. What's the next token gonna be? Can that ever be a small A after that? No, because, right, so we have S is going to produce a big A, and big A is going to produce one single A, and there's, no, there's never going to be anything after that. Uh, so yeah, so that's why little a is not in, in the, um, the follow set of big A. Uh, but by that same logic, this is why little b is in the follow set of big B, because when we have a big B, Right? What could follow it is a little b, because of this rule b goes to big b, little b. So whenever we choose this rule, some string where we choose this rule, there's going to be a little b after the big b. Uh, but the end of file is there because if we chose the rule s goes to b, and then b goes to little b, well, there's nothing else. We've reached the end of the string. We generate a string of length one. Um, so the end of file is at the, the next token. token. So we're gonna do C or have other questions? Remember, we're not being super precise right here. We're just trying to kind of look at this, see if it kind of makes sense. Then we're gonna get to the rules. Yeah? So in, in the future example, are you gonna show where there's like another, like a B, there's a C after it, or like an F? C yes, I believe so. I don't, I don't have it memorized, but yeah. It'll be more complicated, so we'll get to see exactly how it works. So what's the follow set of C? Uh, let's go there. So we'll see uh, a string in the file. 
Uh, so no, no end of strings, remember, or no empty strings. So yeah, so little c, end of file. So why little c? Yeah, it's the first element after, it's the first symbol after a big C, right? So we know that if this rule gets followed, there will be a C following, little c following the big C. What about the end of file? Back to you. Yeah, the same reasoning why it's in A and B, because we also have the rule S goes to big C, and we know that S, the What's going to follow S is always going to follow C, and what follows S is the end of file. Cool. Okay, questions kind of on the intuitive here, or why certain things are or are not here? Or, yeah? So, would end of file come in every process? Will it always be there? No. It just happens to be how this grammar worked out. Any other questions? Yeah? Is there some rule for removing the end of file? Because I would imagine that A wouldn't actually have a follow set of the end of file. Why not? Because B doesn't. What else can, can a big B ever come after a big A? Oh wait, you're right. Right, so yeah, so it's, it's just, so uh, is there ever a way to remove them? No, so these are, the rules are gonna be very similar to follow, uh, to first sets, but different. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it's a good question because it seems like there's too much, but the reason is because of the way this grammar is, right? We have S goes to either A, B, or C, and because of that, nothing's ever gonna follow A, um, except for the end of file. Okay, more questions before we continue? Okay, so, now we're going to go over the fancy, the formalism of the follow rules. So I want you to bear with me and we'll see hopefully in detail how they work and so we can get an understanding of how to apply these rules. Um, so the first thing we do in calculating follow sets is we first calculate first sets. And we'll see why we're going to actually use those in these rules. So you can't do follow sets without first sets. And kind of, kind of hopefully makes sense a little bit intuition, well, we're talking about what's the next character that comes after a given non-terminal. Well, that's probably gonna be the first character of another either non-terminal or terminal. So we may want those first sets. Okay, then we're gonna do the same general structure. We're going to initialize all the follow sets of the non-terminals to the empty set. And then we're gonna apply the rules over and over until the follow sets do not change. And to go off the question earlier, until all of the follow sets do not change. So we're gonna keep applying these until we've applied all the rules uh, everywhere and the follow sets for every non-terminal in the grammar do not change. Okay, so the first rule should be, it's pretty straightforward, it's what we talked about the very first thing I said, right? So if the starting non-terminal, the starting symbol of your grammar, the end of file is always in its follow set, which makes sense. S, the starting non-terminal, is going to generate the entire input string, so the only thing that better be after it is the end of file. Does that make sense? Okay. Then we have a rule. So the important thing here is where in first set, when calculating the first sets, we're looking for non-terminals, we're looking at the left-hand side of the production rules, right? So if we want to calculate, let's say, the first set of A, we're going to look for where A is on the left-hand side and use those rules to generate the first sets. But here, because we care about what comes after, we're going to look at where the non-terminals appear on the right-hand side of the rules. So I'm going to show you the rules, and they're going to be a little bit backwards from the what we described them, but hopefully that makes sense. So here we're concerned with calculating the follow set of some non-terminal A. So if we have a rule of the form B goes to alpha, where alpha is some sequence of non-terminals and terminals, uh, could be an empty sequence, uh, followed by a non-terminal A, then we're gonna add the follow set of B to the follow set of A. Does this make sense? So we're gonna, so this is kind of the same intuition behind why we add in first sets, why we add the first, the leftmost symbols first set to the first set on the left-hand side. Because in this case, whatever follows B 
whatever comes after B is going to have to come after whatever the rightmost symbol is. Uh, yeah, question back there. What did you say alpha was? Alpha is any sequence of terminals and non-terminals, zero or more. So it just represents basically whatever. So what this means is the last. So if A is the last symbol on the right-hand side of the production rule, then we're going to add the follow set of B to the follow set of A. Make sense? I mean, maybe not make sense, but why it's that way. But you'll get the why hopefully later. But does the rule as it stands understand how to implement it? OK, so the next one, so just like on first sets. So on first sets, we started at the very left. And we said, whatever is the first set of the leftmost symbol, we add it to the left-hand side. Uh, and then we would go further down that string, depending on if there were epsilons here. So we're going to apply the same principle. So we're going to say, basically, we start at the rightmost side and add B, the left-hand side rule, add the follow set of B to the follow set of of A, and then we're going to say, can we go to the left? Can we move one more symbol over? And when can we do that? Well, if A is as an epsilon in its first set, exactly. So if A can go to nothing, well, then we can move one over and say, OK, whatever follows, well, here, let's look at this example. So, um, so here we have a rule in the form B goes to, once again, alpha any sequence, zero or more terminals, non-terminals of A followed by C, zero through K, where epsilon is in the first set of all of the zero through Ks. Uh, then we're going to add the follow set of B to the follow set of A. So it basically means, hey, if, so we always add the rightmost, the, we always add the left-hand side non-terminal. We're going to add its follow sets to the rightmost rule by rule number two, right? And then if that rightmost rule has an epsilon in the first set, well, then we can move one more over and add the left-hand side's uh, follow set to that one. And then we can keep doing that for however many of the right-hand sides have epsilon. Questions? Yeah. Uh, you, I think you have it back, because the rule is S goes to B. So in, by rule two here, you're adding the follow set of S to the follow set of B, not the other way around. So that's why I wrote it backwards with the A's and the B's flipped, right? So here we're talking about A. That's what we care about. So here we, talk, we care about things on the right-hand side. More questions? OK. And then we get into, so this is just how to propagate, this is propagating the follow sets, right? But we did something else. So we had a case where we had big C and little c, and we said, well, it makes sense that little c is going to be in the follow set of big C because of how that production rule is. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to say, OK, we care about, remember again, we care about non-terminal A, big A. And what we're going to say is, OK, whatever the next symbol is, in this case, it's C0. So here we just have a rule in the form. B goes to alpha. Remember, once again, alpha is a sequence of non-terminals and terminals, followed by A, this, the non-terminal that we care about. And so this says, what's the next symbol, C0? Let's add the first set of C0 minus epsilon to, to A, to the follow set of A. Right? So this makes sense. So whatever follows my rule, so whenever I choose this production rule, I know that whatever follows A has got to be whatever starts with C0. Because then otherwise it's not a valid string. And we take away epsilon because we don't care about epsilon in follow sets. So no epsilons in follow sets. Does this make sense? More or less? OK, then the last rule is, well, what happens if C0 has an epsilon? Right? Well, then 
C1. We can add the first of C1 minus epsilon to the follow set of A. And what if C1 has an epsilon? Well, then we can add the first set of C2 minus epsilon to the follow set of A. And what if C2? And so on. So that's what this next rule says is starting from the terminal, the non-terminal that we're interested in, A in this case, we can keep adding the first sets of the following symbols as long as they contain an epsilon in their first set. Which makes sense, right? So here, if C0 can produce an epsilon, well, that means there's two possible outputs here. We can either have A, C0, C1, or A, C1. And so that means whatever is in the first set of C1 can follow A. Questions while we read and absorb and meditate on these five beautiful rules. Yeah? Um, it looks like you're only adding CI plus one to the first set of CI plus one, but wouldn't you add the first set of C0, X1, X2? Exactly, yes, you would. So this rule, so C5 is general, right? So, uh, and this was kind of the question that came up in office hours and on the mailing list. And this goes for first sets as well. So yes, this rule applies for, so let's say, all of CI through C0 here, you would also add C1 because you would have applied this when I is equal to zero. And then you would also add C2 because you'd apply it when I is equal to one. So you go out one here. Um, and then you, so you, you would have added it for all of those values. So yeah, that's why you know, it's a nice way to think about it because it's abstract and it defines all those cases. But mechanically, how you operate it is you, well, uh, you start at the following, the symbol following the non-terminal you're interested in, and you say, okay, add that first set to my, to A's follow set. Does that symbol have a non-terminal? Or, sorry, does that symbol have a epsilon in its first set? If so, then we add the following symbol's first set to A's follow set, yeah. Do you start on the far right of this case, or do you start immediately to the right of whichever one you're interested in? Immediately to the right of whatever one you're interested in, yeah. So I like to apply these two separately, so. Whenever I say, okay, I'm, I mean, we'll, we're going to get into it, but when I say, okay, I'm going to apply, uh, I'm, I care about A, so I look, is A, the first thing I say is, is A the last, the far rightmost non-terminal in a production rule, in this production rule that I care about? If the answer is yes, then I apply rule two. If the answer is no, then I say, are all of it to the right to the end of the string epsilons? Are epsilons in its first set? If so, then I add rule three applies, and I'm going to add the follow set of B to the follow set of A. And then I worry about what's after it. Then I say, OK, let's look at A. What's directly after it in this specific rule? Add that first set to my follow set. OK, is there an epsilon there in that first set? Then we can keep going. So yeah. So for example two, where we're adding follow B to follow A, is yes. that to define follow B? Does this define follow B? Yeah, no. for two. It defines follow defines follow A. So we're adding follow B to follow A. Because here, remember, we care about follow, we care about A right now. Um, and remember, because we first set all of the follow sets to the empty set, we can do that, right? So we, there's no, we know the values to start. And if it's an empty set, it's an empty set. And we'll get to B on its turn, and we'll look at where B is located on all of the right-hand side rules. We'll apply all of these rules to B, and then when we come back around, we'll get it eventually. So that's how the propagation happens. More questions, mistakes, that you spot, typos? OK, let's look at an example. I think this will help clarify things. Um, OK, so we're going to use the example that we used for follow sets already. So we're going to use the grammar S goes to big A, B, C, D. We have the rule A goes to big C, big D, or little a, big A. Uh, B goes to little b. Big C goes to little c, big c, or epsilon. D goes to little, little d, big d, or epsilon. And so we're not going to do it again, but we have the first sets of all of those because we calculated it a week ago. So what's the first thing? What do we initialize all of our follow sets to? Empty set. Empty set. Yes. Perfect. OK. Um, oh, and then I'm going to move this a little bit so we have the rules here. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to step through this step by step. 
and show exactly which rules we're talking about at this time and what production rule we're talking about. Uh, any questions so far before we start this process? So you should get the feeling as you're sitting there that, man, this is a very mechanical process. And the answer is yes, it is. This is an algorithm that we're following, a mechanical process to do this. And so in the, the next homework assignment, you're actually, you're gonna program, a, you're gonna create a program to do first sets and follow sets. So you'll see that they are very algorithmic uh, and mechanical. But you need to know how to do it by hand first, right? So that's how you can check the computer. Okay. So the first thing we care about, we're going to start with the follow set of S, right, where we always start. So we're going to go through all the rules, right, one through five. So does rule one apply? Can you read rule one, people in the back? Kind of? Squinting? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Sometimes you got to fit a lot of information on these screens. Um, okay, so yes. Is S, so S here is the starting symbol of the grammar. That means we add the end of file to the follow set of S. Right? So that's really easy. Rule one applies. Okay, is S in any of the right hand sides of any of the rules here? No. No. So then the other four rules don't apply because they only apply to non terminals on the right hand side. So we added the end of file to the follow set of S. And so we're done for S for right now. Okay, then we look at A. So how many rules does A apply? So I guess the first question is, is A the starting terminal of the grammar? No, no. no. so rule one does not apply. Um, how many rules does A appear in on the right-hand side? One, two. Two, two, right? So we have here, S goes to big A, big B, big C, big D, and then A goes to little a, big A. So this is where, this is why, so follow sets are definitely a little bit more tricky because you have to identify all of the places that the non-terminal occurs on the right-hand sides. Okay, so we take each of the rules one by one where A applies on the right-hand side. So let's first look at the first one. S goes to big A, big B, big C, big D. Okay, so we first ask, well, does rule one apply? We already said no, doesn't apply, right? A is not the starting non-terminal. Okay, we apply rule two. Does rule two apply? So yes. the question is, how do you ask, how do you know if rule two applies? Somebody wanna, go ahead. Yeah. Right, so one thing to make sure is we're going through this non-terminal by non-terminal. So if you look at this rule, yes, this rule applies to like this, Follow, the calculation of the follow rule applies to this production because there's obviously a symbol on the rightmost side. But we don't care about D right now. We're only concerned with non-terminal big A. So the question is, is big A the rightmost symbol in this rule? No. 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 So this rule doesn't apply. What about three? So is, are all the symbols from A to the rightmost of the string is epsilon in the first set of all of those? No. No, which one fails? B. B, okay, good. Yeah, I had to double check. I, sometimes you say these things, you don't know the answers. Um, that's why I have you. Uh, okay, so yeah, so this, the third rule here doesn't apply because there's not, remember this is all of those symbols following A have to have epsilon in their first set. And we know we have the first sets here, we can look. First set of B, no, there's no epsilon in the first set of B, so rule three doesn't apply. Okay, now rule four. So rule four says we take the next symbol in the rule, so the symbol following big A, and we're gonna add the first set of that symbol minus epsilon to the follow set of A. So what is, so in this example, what's C0 in our rule? B. B, big B, exactly. Um, so we just follow this rule, we add the first set of B minus epsilon. So the first set of B minus epsilon is the second containing B. And we're gonna add that to the follow set of A. So that rule's done. So this rule doesn't apply anymore, right? We've done it once. Now, what rule five says is if epsilon is in the follow set of B, then add C's first set 
minus epsilon to the fall set of A. And if C has an epsilon in it, add the first set of D to the fall set of A. Um, so we can look at the rule here. We can see, well, no, this doesn't apply because C0, in this case, big B, doesn't have an epsilon in it. So this rule doesn't apply. So then what's in the follow set of A that we just calculated? B. B. Little B. Oh, no. Okay, yeah. So that's what we've calculated so far. But we're not done yet because we have to do this for each of the places where A appears in the right-hand side. So we looked at one place, and now we have to look at the second place. Uh, so the second rule is A goes to little a, little a, big A. So we asked, does the, the okay, we'd ask, if, does the first rule apply? No. It doesn't, no. The first rule doesn't apply, it's not the starting terminal. Then we ask, does the second rule apply? Yes. Is A the very last element on the right-hand side here? Yes, it does. So what do we do? We add the follow set of, in this case, A, to the follow set of A. Okay, great. The, we know the, so if this recursion kind of throws you, remember we've already calculated the follow set of A. The follow set of A is the empty set. So we've added the empty set to our set that we're creating now. No problems. Okay. Um, is there any characters to the right of the A? Are any symbols to the right of the A that have epsilons in them? No. So rule three doesn't apply. Um, is there anything after the big A on the right? No. So this rule doesn't apply. And is there anything after us to the right that has epsilons in it? Also no, because they don't exist. So this rule doesn't apply. Um, and then so we've calculated here that the follow set of big A is little b. And so once again, ask yourself, well, why is this? Well, look at the very first rule. S goes to big A, big B, big C, big D. So whenever there's an A, right, whatever A generates, the next thing that's going to occur in the string is going to be whatever big B produces. And big B is always going to produce only a B. It's going to start with a B. So after we parse an A, the next character is always going to be a B. Or is always going to be at least a B. We're not done yet. So it could be more characters. We know it's at least going to have a B. Questions on how we did A? Yeah. Yeah. So to use rule three, which says that one first. Yes. So in this case, yes. So here we're looking well. Okay, this three, we're looking at this rule, so you probably want that one. Um, yeah, so in this case, we're looking at C0 here is big B. So we look, is epsilon in the first set of big B? Is it? No, so rule three doesn't apply here. So how do we have B? Oh, we, we, ah, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. My mistake. Uh, wait, okay. Rule three is about, sorry, you got me. Uh, so rule three is about if there are epsilons in first set from after us to the end of the string, then we'll add the first set of, the follow set of S to the follow set of A. So this is about, rules two and three are about propagating follow sets from the, the non-terminal on the left-hand side to the terminal that we're interested in. So if there was an epsilon in B, C, and D's first set, then we would add the end of file to the follow set of A. Does that make sense? So yeah. if, uh, if B, C, and D all go to the empty string and don't produce anything, well, that means the next token after A can be the end of file. It can be the last thing that we read. It's not the case here, exactly. So here, rule three does not apply. So what rule do we use to add the rule? So rule four here says that now we look at what's the following to add the first set of the following symbol to our follow set. And that's where the, uh, the little b comes from. Yeah. There's a lot of rules, but as you can see, once you kind of get the hang of it, you just keep applying these. Yeah. So the order here doesn't matter. So uh, the, remember, the order here is just a, uh, you can think of it like syntactical sugar that we have. So we don't, this could be written as two different rules. A goes to CD, 
and another rule after that, A goes to big A, little a. So by, when we talk about we're looking at a rule, we're looking at one of those or cases. So we may have to look at each of them if the non-terminal appears both in both cases. You have questions about A? So in this case, yes. So if, B, so if epsilon was in B, big B here, we would, we would say rule three applies because epsilon is in big the first set of B, epsilon is in the first set of C, epsilon is in the first set of D. That's the entire symbols after me. That means I add the follow set of S to the follow set of A. And the follow set of S we've already calculated is uh, the end of file. Uh, had, had, wait, what? Had rule three no, uh, been true, you had to follow B because follow B is nothing technically. You have to do the end file, right? No, no. So you only add the follow sets of the left hand sides. So here we'd only ever add the follow set of S to the follow set of A. Because right now we only care about A's. So rules two says if we're the last most one on the far right, we're going to add the follow set of S to our follow set. But this rule doesn't apply because we're not, A is not the rightmost character, right? And this says, hey, if, if between you and the end of the string there's all epsilons, well then that means add the follow set of S to your follow set. And then the question is, okay, I think where you're going is, so if let's say epsilon was in B, we would add the end of file character here because of this rule. And we'd add little b because of this rule. And then we look at five and say, okay, five applies because epsilon is in the, the first set of big B. So then we go and add the first set of big C to the follow set of A. And then we say, is there an epsilon in the first set of C? Yes, there is. So then we go and add the first set of D to the follow set of A minus the first set of D minus epsilon to the follow set of A. Make sense? More or less? Okay. I think. I mean, one, that example I think will come up when we get to S, when we get to B. So, uh, should be fairly clear. Okay, so we calculated on this time the follow set of B we calculated is little B or the follow set of A is little B. Yeah. So uh, we calculated the follow set of A on the first grammar first, right? So we had B in the follow set of A, right? If we applied all the rules, all five rules on the first grammar, we got something like follow set of A, right? On which first grammar? Sorry, on the this first, this the first rule, yes. that rule. Yeah. So, so we got follow of A as B, right? By root three. So when we go to the second uh, second grammar. No, 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 no. Rule rule three doesn't apply here, because rule three only applies if after A there's a first set and everything after A. There's not an epsilon in the first set of B. So rule three doesn't apply. Rule four, I mean. Okay, rule four. Yes. yes. So, so you rule. Get, get a set B, the small B for the follow of yes. A, right? Yes. Then you move to the second grammar rule. So that second grammar. Yes. Is one. So so now you will consider for already uh, the the follow one we got from the first grammar. For all the rules, you will consider for this. Uh, so in this case, it doesn't really matter because you're adding it to itself. Right, you're adding A to A, so this is only, the only case that will ever come up. So I just prefer to say, like, think like you're creating a new follow set. You're not done yet until you apply all the rules everywhere. So I would use the empty set here. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So until we've gone through, calculated it, now we know. So uh, we went through, now we know the follow set of A. Uh, so now we can move on and calculate the follow set of B. So. How many rules does the false set, uh, does the non-terminal B occur in? One. One, right, the very first rule. S goes to big A, big B, big C, big D. So we go through all the rules again. Is B no. the starting non-terminal? No. No, okay, good. Uh, is B the last element on the right-hand side of this rule? No. Yes, anyone say yes? No. no. 
No, right? So big B is not on the right, right hand most side. So then rule three says, is it the case that after B until the end of this rule, that there are epsilons in all of those symbols, the, in the epsilons in the first set of all those symbols? Yes, right, yeah, so epsilon is in the first set of C, epsilon is in the first set of D, and so we can say, oh, we can apply this rule. So now we're gonna add the follow set of S to the follow set of, D, of B, which is? Yeah, the end of file, good. Okay, but well, we're not done, right? So we've applied rule three. Now we have to say, we have to apply rule four. So rule four is just add the next symbol after us add the first, the first set of the symbol after us to our follow set. So here we're gonna add the first set of C to the follow set of B minus <coughs> epsilon. Right, so the first set of C we can see is C, epsilon. We take out epsilon. We add C to the follow set of B. Right, so this rule, oh, sorry, did I hit one more? Sorry. Uh, okay, so rule four just says the next one, right? So the one directly after the symbol we care about. So here we have big C is after us. We can calculate the first set of big C. We have already have it. We take out epsilon, we add it to our follow set. Then the question we ask is, okay, for the, for the fifth rule, is for the fifth rule to apply, is there an epsilon in the first set of C? Yes. Yes. So that means we can apply the one after C, the first set of the one after C to the follow set of B. And so we're gonna add the first set of D minus epsilon, so which is the set containing D, we're going to add that to the follow set of B. Uh, is there an epsilon in D, the first set of D? Yes, but there's no more symbols to move, so it doesn't matter, we're done, right? And so now we've calculated, there's no more B, there's no more rules that have big B in them, so we've calculated for this iteration the follow set of B. Yeah. So the question is, could you apply rule five if there was no epsilon in the first set of C? In D, yes, you could still apply it. You would still apply it. So because you only care about the next symbol. So to apply it once, you'd say, is there an epsilon in the one right after me in C? If the answer is yes, then you add the next one. You always add it. You don't care what's in it. And then you go to the next one and say, okay, is there an epsilon in the first set of D? If the answer is no, then it's no, and you don't continue and add the one after. Yeah, you, if there was, you'd go on to E, and you just add E. It doesn't matter what if it's just, if the first set of E is epsilon, you'd still do it. You'd take the set containing epsilon, you'd remove epsilon from, and you'd have the empty set, and then you'd add that to it. It doesn't change anything, you'd still do it. And then you apply and say, does that rule apply again? And then you'd add F, and you'd look at F. You'd always add to F, and then look, is epsilon in the first set of F? And if so, you'd move to G, and so on. Questions on B? If yeah, I am. If there's no, I mean, if there's no epsilon in the first set of D, uh, yes, we would still add D regardless. Or, exactly, because so this rule doesn't. So kind of the key thing here is right. So we're adding the first, like here in the formalism, we're adding the first set of C I plus one. Right? But our condition says C from zero to I has an epsilon in its first set. So you can see this says nothing about what's in C of I plus one. We don't care what's in the next one. We're gonna apply this rule anyways and add what's in the next one. Does that make sense? The same thing with, with first sets. Not in the exact same way, but the same idea. Okay, now we're gonna look at C. How many places is big C used on the right-hand side? How many rules? Three, right? The first rule, uh, the second rule, and the, I don't know how to count them, third, fourth rule, something like that. Uh, okay, so we, look, we just do it one by one. We go through all the rules, all the places that big C exists, and we just keep applying these rules. 
So, okay, we're going to skip the is C a starting non-terminal. It's not. Uh, none of them except for S. Okay, in this rule, is C at the very end of this rule on the no. right handmost side? No. No. So rule two, rule two does not apply. Okay. Rule three. From C to the end of the right hand side, yes. is there epsilon in all of those symbols? In the yes. first sets of all those symbols? Yes. Yes, right? So the question here specific is is epsilon in the first set of big B? Yeah. So we can apply this rule. So how do we apply this rule? Well, we take the follow set of S and we're going to add, add it to the follow set of C. So we've calculated the follow set of S is the set containing the end of file, so we're going to add end of file to C's follow set. Okay. Then we simply, so this is another thing, right? We're going to just take, we look at the next symbol after C in this rule, and we're going to say, does this rule, is there a symbol after C? Yes. It's big B. So we're going to follow this rule, just take the first set of big B, a big D minus epsilon from it and add it to the false set of A. So in this case, we're going to add um, the second dating D. So now we have the end of file and little d. Yeah? That's a good question. Uh, you could probably replace that with alpha and it would be the same. I don't know, just. Uh, Exactly, yeah, in this one. Um, yeah, so rule four, yeah, exactly, simply says the next one, which is kind of simple. So these, there's some parallels between these two sets of rules, right? This says, is it the very last right-hand most side? And if yes, then you can apply this rule. So it's very binary in that sense. Uh, the same with rule four. Apply the next one if there is one. Um, and then we, Exactly, yeah. Exactly, so we only care about the next one in rule four. Exactly. Okay, so we're, we've added little d to the follow set of c. Now we're gonna see if rule five applies. So is there an epsilon in the first set of d? Yes. Yes, yes there is, but there's no symbol afterwards, so it doesn't matter, right? There's nothing to add after d. So uh, rule five, I think you can say, does not apply. Because even though the condition may be true, there's no i plus 1 to add. Nothing to add. So we, in that case, wouldn't we also be getting the same result for A implies C, big C, big D? Uh, say that again. I almost knocked off the mic. That's a distraction. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't A implies big C, big D give us no new information? Because that's what we just did in S implies big A, big C, big D. I'm not like, sure I understand the question. So you mean like, the production rule? Uh, no, no, no rules that are applying to what we just did are going to apply to A implies big C, big D. Um, we don't know yet. We haven't looked at it. That's the, I mean, OK, I guess you're kind of trying to cheat ahead and say, can I use the information I know here? Because I just calculated something for C and D for rules four and five. And because that only mattered with those specific symbols, can I reuse that later when I do A goes to C, D, right? Um, I mean, does yeah. that Does that, I mean, would that work? Or is that something you have to, you always have to individually calculate it? So we're going to go over this as a very rigid mechanical process you can follow. OK. Uh, so that's, that's what I'll say about that. Yeah? On the exam, you can use rules. On what? Uh, yes, the rules will be on the exam, but I wouldn't, like, if you're flipping back and forth to see which ones apply or which ones don't apply, you're going to have problems. Um, but if it's like a refresher just to look and be like, ah, yes, okay, I'm not missing something obvious, then that's how I would use those. Can I memorize 10 rules? Ten? Okay. Okay, so we've looked at... C in the first rule. Now we're going to go to the next place C is used, which is in this rule. A goes to big C, big D. And we go through the same thing. We say, is C at the very end of this rule, the right hand most side? No, it's not. There's a D in the way, so we can't apply this. Uh, is there an epsilon, though, in all the symbols after C to the end of the right hand side? Yes, there's an epsilon in D. So we can apply this rule. So we're going to add the first 
uh, we're going to add the, sorry, we're going to add the follow of A to the uh, follow of C. And so the follow of A is little b. Uh, so here in this case, so in this case, right, we did follow these rules because, uh, because here we care about the leftmost side of the rule. Um, so for these rules, okay, so what's the next symbol right after to the right of C in this rule? D, D, right? So we add the first set of D minus epsilon to the uh, follow set of C. So we add little d. Uh, and then we say, okay, is there an epsilon in, in that big D? The answer is yes. Um, but there's no symbol after that, so this rule doesn't apply. So there's no i plus 1 here. Okay, but then we go to the third, right? So this is not the only place. We go to the third rule where C is used, and we go through these things again. Is C the last element of this rule? Yes. Yes, it's the right hand most side of this rule. So we add the follow set of C to the follow set of C. Okay, cool. Uh, didn't change anything. Okay, is there something, uh, is there anything with epsilons after us, after C? No. No? no? Um, no. Is there anything after us? No. no? Is there anything after us with an epsilon in it? Also no, there's nothing after us, there's nothing after us with an epsilon. Okay, so we've, we've, we've looked at all the places where C exists in the rules and we've calculated that the false set of C is uh, end of file D and B. Is that right, right? Sure, okay, cool, yeah. If you were deriving it in what? Ah, okay. And if we were deriving a sentence in this grammar, when would a little d follow a big C? A little b? Um, it would be, ah, so it's this rule here. So we have, uh, we go s goes to a, b, c, d, and then we have a goes to c, d. So that's where we get our c. And then if d goes to epsilon, d basically disappears which means uh, b goes to little b, which means there ha there, there's got to be a little b after it. So remember, it doesn't mean that it, so it means it has to, one of the, the, the next token after c has to be one of these tokens, otherwise it's not a valid string in our grammar. Good question. All right, what about for d? Okay, how many places is d used? How many rules? Three. Three times, we're gonna do the same thing. So we say, is it the last element here? Yes. Yes, so we apply this rule directly. We have the, the follow set of S to the follow set of D, which is the uh, end of file. And then we say, okay, is there anything after it? No. That has epsilons? No, there's nothing after it. Um, okay, so we don't follow that. And then we say, uh, let's add the next one. Is there anything after D? No. No, so we don't, this rule doesn't apply. Is there anything after it that has epsilons? No, so this rule doesn't apply either. Uh, so we added, from this rule we added the um, end of file. And now we look at this rule and we say, okay, is, it, is D the last most, yes. rightmost uh, symbol here? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we add the follow set of A to the follow set of D. Um, so this is gonna add little b. And then we say, okay, uh, there's nothing after us, so it doesn't matter if they all have epsilons. Um, and then we say, okay, do we add the next one? Is there something after us? No, so we don't care. And we don't care if anything after us has an epsilon because there's nothing after us. Okay, then we look at the third rule. And we say, okay, all right, is D the last element here on the right, the rightmost element here? Yes. Yes, so we're gonna add D. We're gonna take the false set of D, add it to the false set of the D. It's empty set, um, so that doesn't change anything. Is there anything after big D? No. On the right-hand side, nope. This rule doesn't apply. Is uh, there anything else after D? No, this doesn't apply. There's nothing after D, so this doesn't apply. Okay, so we calculated that the false set of D is dollar sign and little b. Yeah? If there was a little c after D. What if there was a little c after D, like here? Yeah. Uh, then, that, then we would say that we would add the first set of little c to the false set of big D. Uh, yeah, which is the first set of little c is little c, and so we'd add that to it. 
exactly. And so yeah, it's not in this example, but in the last example, that was why we had uh, one of the symbols in the follow sets. I can't remember which one it was. Okay, so the question is, are we done? No. Why? Because stuff changed. Because stuff changed, right. We added stuff to the sets, the, set, the follow sets changed, so we have to do this whole thing again. Um, so, are we really gonna? Okay, we'll go through it kind of quickly, yes. Uh, so that you can, but it's here, so you can go through it and verify on your own that you apply these rules. Um, okay, so we look at S, we um, say that, to look at S, we say, okay, rule one applies, S is the starting non-terminal, um, and then we see, is S in any of the right-hand sides? No. no, so none of these rules apply. So we get the empty string. We look at A, we look at this rule, and we say, okay, is A at the very end of this string? No, two doesn't apply. Is, uh, for the third rule, is there epsilon in everything after A in the first sets of B, C, and D? No, so that doesn't change. Um, we add the next thing after A's first set to the follow set of A. So we add the first set of big B to the follow set of A, which is B, and then we go to the next rule. We apply everything. Uh, doesn't change. Then we look at B, we look at B in this rule. Um, does rule two apply here? No. Somebody want to say yes? Yes. You want to explain? Say yes? No, you just want to say it? Okay, good. Yeah. Always got to think positive, right? Yes. Um. Yes. Yes, okay, no, the answer's no, the answer's no. <laughs> rule. Uh, rule two does not apply because B, we're talking about B, B is not the rightmost symbol in this rule, right? But rule three applies because epsilon is in C and D after here, so we can add the first set of S to the first set, I'm sorry, the follow set of S to the follow set of B. And then, we, and then B doesn't appear anywhere else, so we're done with B. Uh, we know that it's uh, B, C, and D. Oh, we didn't add C and D. Okay. Well, you should go through and do that. Um, all right, let's do that. So then we'd add rule four. So we look at rule four and we'd say, okay, we add the first set minus epsilon of the symbol after B, in this case is big C. So we'd add little c uh, to the follow set of B. And then we'd say, is there an epsilon in the thing right after B? Yes, that means rule five applies, which means we can apply the one after that. So we add the first set of D minus epsilon to the follow set of B. And we say, is there an epsilon in, in that? Yes, there is. But there's no symbols after that, so it doesn't matter, we've stopped. Okay, so we get this. Should there be a where? Where would the B come from? Remember, follow sets only get propagated off of the first two, the, off of rules two and three. So we only ever add the follow set from the leftmost symbol of a rule to one of the symbol non-terminals on the right. So this kind of goes to that question is, is um, can a B ever follow a big B? Well, what can follow a big B, a C or a D? Right? And C's can only produce C's or nothing. D's can only produce little D's or nothing. Uh, so a lowercase b, a small b can never follow a capital B. Because you think about it, capital B itself is the only thing that can generate a little b. Okay, then we look at C, we apply the rules. Is it the last one? No. So rule two doesn't apply. Rule three applies because the last one is not. Rule three does apply because epsilon is in the first set of D. So we add the first set of S to the first set of, uh, the follow set of S, excuse me, to the follow set of C. It's kind of hard when you're trying to talk through these fast. Um, but if you go slowly, it's very simple. Um, and then we'd add rule four. We use rule four to add the first set of D to the follow set of C. And then we'd look at this rule. <coughs> we'd look at this rule. We would apply, we'd see that nothing changes. Uh, then we'd look at D. So we'd look at this, yeah. No. Well, for in general, no. The in general, the order of sets do not matter. It does matter on your homework, so just make sure uh, that that is clear. 
OK. I mean, the order here is kind of actually, if you think about it later, the order is the order that we derive them from the rules. That's how I tried to keep it, but there's no guarantee, just because it's kind of uh, tricky. OK, so we uh, apply all these five rules to the D here. We'd apply all these five rules to the capital D here. We'd apply all these five rules to the D here. And then we'd see that the false set of D did not change. So nothing changed. So we're done with follow sets here. We've reached, these are the follow sets. Yeah? Uh, while calculating follow C and follow D in the second uh, row column, we uh, uh, added follow A of the, uh, follow A, which is small p, from the same column. So is mm -hmm. that the reason why nothing changed? Yes. Yeah, so nothing, I mean, the reason is because all the additions to follow sets that we made happened when we first went through it. It just happened to be that way. Uh, there's no guarantee that you only have to do it three times. So yeah, you just have to keep cranking this because follow sets could propagate through rules based on rules one and two, or sorry, rules two and three. Um, so you just have to make sure you keep going through this until you uh, you've haven't changed any of the follow sets. Uh, questions on follow sets? Yes, that's a good question. Um, I'm teaching you how to do it, so you'll always get the right answer every single time. So you can think of it as like a parity check, right? So if you like do those four and five rules again and you get something different, then something is very wrong. Um, yeah, that's a good point, because you're not actually changing. So rules four and five aren't based on follow sets. They're based on the first sets, and the first sets remain fixed. Um, yeah, it's a good optimization. More questions on follow sets? Are they easier than first sets? It's not like a, it's not a hypothetical question. I don't know. No? Maybe? Yes? I don't know. You haven't done them, so maybe, maybe they're not. They're a little bit trickier, but the same general idea. So as long as you can kind of keep these rules straight and apply and make sure you know which set you're doing, uh, it's very mechanical. OK. So now we get back to why are do we spend all this time, like a long time, going over uh, in excruciating detail the calculation of the follow sets and the first sets? Um, and is it because I'm a super very mean person? Maybe. But mostly it's because we're going to use them to prove that a grammar has a recursive, uh, predictive recursive descent parser. Um, so the whole point here, so if you kind of break these rules up, uh, predictive is the thing that we care about. So the question there is, for each rule, can we know which of the production rules we're trying to follow, that this string followed? Um, and this will be very clear, but you have the rules where A goes to something or something else, right? When we're parsing and we have the string, we want to know, well, which one of these can we follow? Um, so that's where predictive comes in. Recursive, we'll see why. And descent means we go from the top down. Um, and so. Specifically for predictive, what we want is that each parsing step, there's only thanks. Uh, there's only one grammar rule that we can choose. Uh, so that way, we can be very efficient. We're not going to do any backtracking. So you can write a parser that tries every single combination of parsing rules until it finds something that fits. Uh, but that wouldn't be predictive, because you're trying everything. Uh, so here, we want to be predictive. We want to be precise. OK, so these two conditions have to hold for the grammar to uh, support a predictive parser. And they are, for the first one is, uh, and it, it makes sense why you think about it and why we've been talking about this. So the first rule is that if you have, if we have two rules uh, with the same left-hand side symbol, so A produces something, in this case alpha, and A produces beta, then the first set of alpha intersected with the first set of beta better be the empty set. So what does this mean? No ambiguity. Right, yeah, there's no ambiguity here. I know exactly just by, and the, the important thing is here, just by looking at the next token, right? Because the first set is the set of possible tokens. So I know that by looking at the next token, I know exactly which one of these rules applies. Al A goes to alpha or A goes to beta. Um, and note that this applies for all rules here. Um, and 
So the other kind of trick here, the other important thing, is that remember alpha and beta are sequences of terminals and non-terminals. So you don't just take the first rule, you have to consider the entire rule. Uh, and we'll get into that. Uh, okay, but this isn't enough. So this tells us what to do uh, if we have a choice of which parsing rules we want to parse. So the second rule is, well, what happens if epsilon is in the first set of A, right? Well, then how do we know if, if we go to nothing or if we go to uh, choose one of our rules? And so that's where this comes in. So if epsilon is in the first set of A, then the intersection between the first set of A and the follow set of A better be the empty set. Right, so this kind of makes sense. So this means we can tell if, if A goes to epsilon, that means A is nothing. So the follow set tells us what are all the tokens that could potentially be af start after A. And so, but if, if that one of those tokens is the same as the first set of A, then we don't know if we should choose one of those rules or if we should uh, choose the epsilon rule. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically both these rules are saying that we want to know what tool we're going to use. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a good way to formalize it so that you know. So if I asked you, hey, here's a grammar. Uh, can you write a predictive descent parser, uh, a predictive parser, you follow these rules and show. The way you do that is you show for every a uh, rule where there's two rules, you show that those first sets are, uh, the intersection of those first sets is empty, and then you show for anything that has an epsilon in the first set, you show that the intersection between the first set of A and the follow set of A is the empty set. Okay, so what are the steps? So you want to create a predictive recursive descent parser. Maybe it's because you're taking this class and you have to. Maybe it's because you find out on your job it's the best thing to solve the problem that you have. Uh, so what do you do? You first create a context-free grammar, right? So you kind of, we've seen, we've seen context-free grammars. You create one, somebody gives it to you. You calculate first and follow sets, right? Then you prove that the CFG allows a predictive recursive descent parser based on those two rules we just talked about. And then you write the predictive recursive descent parser using the first and follow sets that you calculated. Um, so it's probably pretty clear we're not going to get to it today, but we're going to set it up for Monday. So a good example that I found in the real world is email addresses. So may, I think I may have hinted to it earlier in the class, but it kind of seems like a trivial problem if you think about it, right? Well, how do I parse an email address? Right? I mean, what, what would you try? Say, say something it louder. At something dot yeah, something at something dot something, right? Kind of name at domain dot tld or whatever, yeah. Um, so it turns out that in the real world, it's not really this simple and that a lot of things that are actually valid email addresses will fail this check. Uh, some things that are definitely not valid email addresses will pass that check. Um, what about, so it turns out you can include uh, in the local part in double quotes a string, right? So you can have the string CSE340 in double quotes at example.com. Yeah, this is a valid email address. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere, so the whole reason why I use example.com is that domain is guaranteed to not exist or host anything. It's actually one of the RFCs. Um, so yeah, you read the email RFC. This is a legitimate email address. You can have crazy characters like uh, slashes and equal signs in your email address. Uh, you can actually have at signs in the left-hand side of the email address, as long as you include it in double quotes. Um, you can include a slash in the double quotes. And because, you know, like when you're writing this back in the, I don't know, 80s or whatever, this RFC, you're like, well, but you know, if you're using double quotes to quote something, you have to be able to quote the, the double quotes. So you can use double quotes in your email address because why wouldn't you want to? Um, so this is also a valid email address. Um, and so you can put, because of this, you can, not only this, you can actually put email addresses inside email addresses and then you can have, so, so some people have seen like you have your name and then followed by brackets and email address, right? So that's actually, 
can also be a valid email address depending on how you're using the email address. So if you're like a mail server and you want to send, especially if you want to send mail, like Gmail needs to know how to parse those. Uh, so to like Gmail, this is a this would be a should be a valid email address. Uh, but it's like crazy. I have an at sign within the double quotes, and I have like a name. So my name here would be test and then space, and then example space at hello with an email address of test at example.com. Uh, so these are, these are all valid email addresses, and this is like madness, right? Um, so, uh, so they're so crazy, email addresses in general are so crazy that there's a company uh, called Mailgun, does anybody use them or know what they are, get spam from them? Um, so they're a company that provide an API for developers to send out emails. And so they actually, the core part of their business model is how to deal with email addresses. And so they realized that this would be super valuable, so they open sourced this tool of how to validate email addresses. Um, and so they actually, it turns out, so you, you can, I'll, I'll have a link to this code in a second, but you can go download the code and they implemented a parser uh, for email addresses. So they implemented a recursive descent parser, uh, which is really, really cool. Uh, here's the email address, you can check it out. Um, so we'll go over, I just wanted to talk about the CFG. So this is what I did, is I, I found their tool, I ripped out their context-free grammar, and so this is, so these are all the tokens in their grammar, so quoted strings, so there's quotes around the strings that we looked at, and atom is pretty much like an identifier, just any kind of bits, uh, dot atom and white space, and this is their crazy context-free grammar. So this is their entire context-free grammar. So this is doing two things. A, showing you that what, hopefully what I'm teaching you is not going to be completely useless. This is stuff that actually exists in the real world and real programmers do and implement these things. And two, on Monday, we're going to go through an example of this simplified email address CFG. We're going to go through it, we're going to calculate first sets, follow sets, prove that it has a predictive recursive descent parser, and then write that predictive, predictive recursive descent parser. So, thank you. Hey there, I have a quick question. Yes, uh, you should wait a little bit.